Hi, everyone. My name is James Pollock. I'm the Director of Communications for the Summit County Prosecutor's Office. Thank you for attending uh, tonight's uh, community forum on juveniles in the justice system. Uh, we are going to get started right now with Summit County Prosecutor Sherry Bevan Walsh. Thank you, James. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Summit County Prosecutor's Office Ambassadors for Equity and Social Justice presentation of Juveniles in Our Justice System. Tonight is the first of what we hope are many forums to engage the community about issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Tonight, we are going to take a closer look at juveniles in the justice system from the process to prosecution and the impact on victims and our community. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have a great group of speakers. I wanna thank all of them for being here tonight. We have Summit County Juvenile Court Judge Linda Teodosio. We have Donovan Harris, the re-entry director at South Street Ministries. We have Rhonda Hawkins, mother of Paris Wicks III. We have Assistant Summit County Prosecutor Maureen Walsh, who is also the supervisor in my Juvenile Delinquency Division. And finally, we have Patricia Milhoff from the Summit County Legal Defender's Office. So for all of you participating this evening, if you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat room. We will do our best to monitor the questions and we'll relay them to the presenters. Finally, I just want to say thank you to my ambassadors for Equity and Social Justice Committee for organizing this event, as well as Tanya Niemer, who is our community outreach prosecutor. And Tanya is the one who will be facilitating this conversation. So at this point, I'd like to get started and turn this over to Tanya, who will tell you a little bit more first about our speakers tonight. Thank you, Sherry. Our first panelist is Donovan Harris. He was born and raised in Akron, Ohio. Uh, Donovan is the liaison for Summit County's Reentry Network, where he assists individuals who have returned to society after, after a period of incarceration. At the age of 18, Donovan was sentenced to a lengthy prison sentence. He and a group of friends committed a series of robberies in and around Summit County, earning them the nickname, the Cooler Bandits from local media. In 2014, a feature length documentary also called The Cooler Bandits was released featuring Donovan and his counterparts following them as they made the transition from incarceration to freedom. From a conversation with Harry Belafonte, Donovan became inspired and started Gravity 330, a nonprofit organization with the mission of helping people from the inner city discover their own personal purpose. Donovan is a proud father of two children and he spends time instilling in them the love and compassion necessary to help be a part of the change. Our next presenter is Rhonda Hawkins. She's born and raised in East Akron. Rhonda spent a lot of her childhood at the local community centers. As a working mother of three, she volunteered with and co-founded multiple youth organizations that have focused on academic and athletic excellence. Her children also participated in these youth organizations. Rhonda is a career IT professional and a leader and is married with two daughters, three bonus sons, and one Ghana baby. On August 29th, 2013, Rhonda's 23-year-old son, Paris Wicks II, was shot, brutally beaten, and killed by four gang members at the Lover's Lane Market. Her son, Paris, was shot while he was trying to aid his best friend, who was also shot. All the perpetrators are currently in prison, three young adults serving life sentences. The fourth, the shooter, was 15 years old at the time and is currently serving a sentence of life with eligibility for parole after 30 years. Our next panelist is Patricia Milhoff. She's a graduate of Kent State University and the University of Akron School of Law. Her legal career has taken her from the farmlands of Northwestern Ohio, where she represented migrant farmers and workers to the death house at Lucasville, where a client she represented during his federal habeas corpus proceedings was executed. Currently, she is man the managing attorney with the Summit County Legal Defender's Office. From 2017 to 2022, she represented youth charged with offenses in Summit County Juvenile Court. 
Our next panelist is Judge Linda Teodosio. She's a 1980 graduate of the University of Akron and a 1982 graduate of the University of Akron School of Law. Judge Teodosio has worked as an attorney in private practice, a magistrate in the Akron Municipal Court, and as a staff attorney for the Ninth District Court of Appeals. Judge Teodosio was elected judge of the Cuyahoga Falls Municipal Court in 1997, where she served until she was elected as Summit County Juvenile Court judge from the term beginning January 1st, 2003. Judge Teodosio's work on the juvenile court bench has been extensively recognized. She has received numerous awards for her work, too many to list here today. In addition to her awards, Judge Teodosio has also served as president of the Ohio Bar Association, the Akron Bar Association, the Akron Bar Foundation, and the University of Akron School of Law Alumni Association. Judge Teodosio is married to Judge Thomas Teodosio of the Ninth District Court of Appeals. Her son, Christopher, is a practicing attorney who makes his home in Summit County with his wife, Catherine, and their three daughters. They remember their late daughter through the Andrea Rose Teodosio Foundation. Our last panelist is Maureen Walsh. She's a supervisor of the delinquency unit in the juvenile division for the Summit County Prosecutor's Office. The delinquency unit is charged with prosecuting youth who commit status offenses offenses that would be criminal if committed by an adult, juvenile traffic offenses, and adults who are charged with contributing to the delinquency of minors. Ms. Ms. Walsh has been an attorney for 37 years and has been with the Summit County Prosecutor's Office since 2015. In January of 2021, in response to the increase in gun violence in our community, she was appointed as the designated gun violence prosecutor in juvenile court. She continues to advocate for criminals for, excuse me, for victims of violent crimes and promote community safety while working to find solutions to help youth who are caught in the entanglement of gun violence. So we only have a little bit of time here today. Um, this, this, pre this question and answer period is going to end at 7.30. So we're gonna start um, getting, as we got to know our panelists, we're gonna start with some questions and some conversation. And Judge Teodosio, I'd like to start with you, but each panelist will have the opportunity to share their thoughts with each question as well. So we'll start with the fact that we just started talking about, and even before um, the attendees uh, came here today, we were talking about the increase in gun cases over the past couple of years. Judge Teodosio, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in the court and how are we as a community approaching these increased levels of violence and guns in our community? Well, thank you, Tanya, for the question and for having me today. And Prosecutor Walsh, thank you so much for hosting this. It's an honor to be on this panel with these other uh, wonderful panelists. Um, it has been quite alarming, I think, to everyone to see the increase of uh, um, offenses involving firearms in teenagers. We know that's a not a good mixture. Um, I pulled our detention roster from yesterday and out of the 28 youth that were being held in detention yesterday, eight of them had offenses that, 18 of them, excuse me, had offenses that involve firearms, which is a significant number. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it's frightening. Um, obviously that if a youth commits a serious offense involving a firearm, um, the penalties uh, for that youth are significant. Uh, for certain kinds of offenses, such as aggravated robbery, aggravated murder, murder, aggravated burglary with a firearm, the law in the state of Ohio requires that those youth be transferred to the general division to be tried as adults if they are either 16 or 17 years old. Um, for other offenses, you know, we uh, take them very seriously. And I will say that our youth that are committed to the Department of Youth Services are largely youth that are either violent in some other ways or have committed an offense that involve firearms. I do have to say though, uh, in response to what we're seeing uh, involving firearms to paint a clear picture, that there are two types of firearm offenses that we see in my mind. Uh, the first are those individuals that have a firearm, uh, that use it, uh, that plan out an offense that they're going to commit and use a firearm in doing so. And obviously those youth present a safety to our communities and need to be dealt with accordingly. But I, I also see a second group of youth that, that caused me a great deal of concern because I think that they're equally in danger. But I think of them as the youth that, ha that are afraid and don't feel safe in their communities. And they have possession of a firearm, uh, perhaps without any intent to use it, but feel that they need it for their own protection and safety. 
So I think it's important when you think about these firearm cases to think of the violent offenses and the kids that are using them in the commission and those other kids that may not feel safe and therefore are being charged with possession or having it in a motor vehicle when they're simply trying to keep themselves safe. Judges, just a follow up question. Do you think that you see more individuals who are trying to keep themselves safe than than you know youth who are using it in the commission of a, a crime? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, Donovan, I, I'd like to hear your uh, perspective on this, you know, as, as somebody who helps individuals re-enter the community. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Um, first of all, I'd like to say I'm, I'm very honored to be on this panel. So it's, it's a blessing just to be able to share some of my experiences and, you know, hear, hear from different sides that we may not always hear from because of the people that I work with daily because of our people. But um, I, I would agree with everything Judge Tiodosio just said. I mean, we see, the, we see the statistics that what happens after they come from her and then they end up with us. So it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's just a carryover from the sentencing through the incarceration to the reentry. It's all, it, the, the statistics don't change. The faces may change, but the statistics remain the same. Thank you. Maureen, as a prosecutor, can you, um, you know, give us a little perspective on what you're seeing? Talk a little bit about how um, you know, the prosecutor's office is approaching these increased levels in, in violence. Sure. Well, I agree with a lot of what um, Judge Teodosio said, um, but I actually see also a third group. So we have the group of individuals that have used guns in a violent way, such as for a robbery or a murder, um, or were involved in a shootout. We have a group of kids that are carrying guns because they see the violence in the neighborhood and have seen friends and loved ones that have been murdered or have been shot out. But there's an additional group um, that are the gang members that um, actually at times are associated more with the first group and that have been involved with people that have actually been involved in um, shootouts within the neighborhood. And I think at times um, we really need to recognize that third group who may not have yet shot at somebody, but who is involved in a, in a car perhaps and has a gun with five other individuals who also have guns, including AR-15s that have not yet engaged in shooting, but are definitely not in that situation where they are just afraid of um, being attacked, but they're actually involved back and forth. Um, I think we all know how we deal with the first group um, because that's kind of defined by law. Um, with regards to the group that are afraid, what I really like is that Judge T. Doshio started a um, what's called the DARP program, Detention Release Alternatives, where kids that come in with the first or second times with a gun aren't held in detention with those that have murdered people or committed aggravated robberies, but actually find a way to get them back into the community um, with um, GPS monitoring so that the community has that safety aspect. Um, and know where they're at and that they're not involved with other individuals. And so you can kind of work through the case and see how we can help. What I'd like to hear from Donovan a little bit, if I may, um, is that we really do know how to deal with the first and the last group, but we haven't yet come up with an answer of how do we solve the safety issue. And I believe until we start looking at what we can do to those children that are carrying guns because they're living in a neighborhood where they've seen violence or been exposed to violence, what can we do um, either as a court or as a prosecutor's office to find a way to give them solutions to that fear short of carrying a gun? And um, I think that's the one area that we've all been kind of trying to find a solution because until we start to solve that um, some of these young people carry a gun one day and the next day they're dead, you know, or they've shot somebody. And, and there's been that disconnect that um, I, I don't think as a community, we've really yet been able to solve or to help. Okay. Go ahead. Do I answer that now? Okay, yeah, I just want to make sure you want to talk out of turn. But um, no, out of turn. <laughs> I think when we, when, we, when, we, when we identify the youth that we deal with, I think there are levels. There are levels to our, what we call at-risk youth. I think when we start to talk about certain youth, we are talking about critically at-risk youth. That was a term uh, 
turned by a lady that started a, a youth uh, program in Birmingham that I got a chance to meet. And uh, it's, a lar- it's a large number of youth living in conditions and situations that uh, uh, just surviving is iffy. So when we got regular at-risk youth, we got, they labeled that because of their socioeconomic status or the crime in the neighborhood or the families they come from. But when you got critically at-risk youth, you got youth that that really the day-to-day survival or the day-to-day living is 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 iffy. It's is might not even it, it may not even happen. I may not even be here tomorrow. Those are the ones that you say you see here today and then tomorrow they are gone. I think what our youth have lost and what we have lost is our our youth don't have the ability to dream. They don't have hope. And when you take away hope and you take away the ability to dream, then you take away the opportunity to believe that I can be a success. If I don't have hope, I don't have the ability to dream. I can't be a success because the one thing that's missing from a lot of that is love. A lot of our critically at-risk youth don't have love. So uh, you got at-risk youth that return home to maybe parents that they may not be uh, educated to certain degrees. They may not have degrees, college education, whatever, but they still believe in the, in the school system. But when you talk about critically at-risk youth, you're talking about youth that are going home to parents who are encouraging them to quit school, pick up the gun, pick up a package and sell drugs. So when you go in there and you're talking about a whole different level of, 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 of sickness, that these youth are dealing with. And these are the youth that we see uh, more and more walking around with guns and not scared to shoot them. When you don't have hope, not only do I not mean anything to me, you don't mean anything to me. So crime and and prison and and, and jail and and hurt, that becomes my reality because I don't care or love myself because I've never been loved. I keep trying not to look at all the questions popping. Yeah, there's a lot. And we're going to get to the questions at the end um, for the last half an hour. I do want to hear um, from both Rhonda and Pat. And and, and Rhonda, I'm going to start with you. Um, You know, you worked, you know, with a lot of of community organizations. You had sent your kids to these organizations. And you also now have seen, you know, your son be a victim um, to to children who don't have that love or that hope. Can you can you shed a little bit of light on your thoughts on on what, what we're talking about right now? Well, first, I'd like to thank you um, for the opportunity uh, to be present with this panel and to speak from a, a parent uh, perspective. Uh, interestingly enough, um, Paris was one of those uh, young people who fell into that second category. Um, maybe a year and a half to two years prior, um, he got stopped with a firearm. And his best friend who was with him when he got uh, murdered actually lived in the neighborhood in which he was killed. And so they were accustomed to the issues that were in that neighborhood. And his friend had actually got his window shot out of his car um, that two year period prior. And so his friends, this group of friends decided they all wanted to go get their concealed carry. And so they went, got their firearms and went to training. He hadn't signed up for the course yet, Um, but he had spoken to me about it. Um, he at that time was out on his own, but he came to the house and he, he sat me down and he said, mom, I want to tell you, you know, this is what I'm doing. And he explained to me that he had the firearm prior to, um, but I explained to him at, you know, 21, if you feel like you have to have a firearm and you feel like you have to go get trained to use a firearm, you know, that calls into question the places that you're going and who you're hanging around. So we had a discussion and me being a woman of faith and a praying mom, when he left the house, you know, I, I cried, but I also prayed. And, you know, as a praying woman, I learned from that, you know, situation to be careful what I pray for because the Lord answers. Um, I prayed that, you know, that whatever the Lord wanted to do, whatever he needed to do to prevent him from either using it or having it used against him, to do it. Um, And maybe 20 minutes after he left the house and I prayed that prayer, he got pulled over by the University of Akron police. And they asked if he had a firearm in the car and he said, yes. And so he got picked up. Um, But understanding that there are those young people who are afraid and they go into those neighborhoods, they live in those neighborhoods, not necessarily, you know, participate in the activities, Um, but they live in those neighborhoods and they are afraid. I grew up around that neighborhood. It's totally different now than it was when I was a kid. 
So Pat, um, best for last here, can, can you, you know, we've heard a little bit of this discussion of fear, um, you know, the, the three different groups that we can um, possibly run into and, and, and Rhonda has now um, really put a little bit of focus on those who are, are trying to defend themselves. Can you, can you shed a little bit of light on this? You know, what are your thoughts um, on, on what was just discussed? Yeah, I think it's interesting. We come from many different places, but we all are kind of at the same place. And that is we all recognize um, this critically at risk group. And that is who we deal with a lot in juvenile court. As far as the three groups, I think it's hard to identify them at the beginning. You know, when you're at the end of the river, pulling them out after they have drowned, you know, then we say, oh, this child had this or this child needed that and we didn't get it. But I think it's hard in day to day and as we work our various jobs, it's hard to identify that. A couple things I wanna comment on. One is we all know the incarceration rates that we've seen over the, you know, the past 20 years or however far back you wanna go. Many of the children we deal with are not many, but several are children of incarcerated parents or incarcerated families. And so when we talk about you know, hopelessness or where they're coming from, often they come from places where there was no hope from a very early age. So I think the schools can play a role here. I always say I'm not religious, but a lot of the good work we see in our community comes out of churches. You know, we have people who really are committed to helping youth. But I think this problem is much deeper than this panel. I think we have to look at poverty. I think we have to look at the educational system. Somebody, I think Pastor Harrison mentioned housing. You know, I used to say living in, I hope this doesn't offend anyone, but living in the Rosemary is a risk factor by itself. You know, there are housing um, developments in our community where gun violence is high, crime is high, kids are at risk just walking out the door of their house. So I think we have to provide people a safe place to live, a safe place to go to school, a safe place to eat. And a lot of our kids are missing those things. And I think this is a societal problem. I mean, I think to look at this as, oh, juvenile court can solve this problem. Juvenile court can't solve this problem any more than it can solve my problems. I mean, these are big problems. The other thing I wanna comment on, and everybody knows this about me, we live in a gun culture. And if you went around and asked people, you know, ordinary people in the community, they're carrying. Now we have, you know, you don't need a permit to concealed carry. Well, we're raising our children in that environment and then we expect them not to want firearms. We expect them to drive around without a firearm. We expect them in their homes to not want a firearm. Well, the whole world thinks that everybody should be armed. So I don't know how we keep children safe in that environment. And that's just my politics and I'll admit that. But I don't think you can act like everyone can have a gun and everyone can carry all the time and then be surprised when children pick up on that. So. Judge Chidosu, we've heard a lot about, you know, the guns in schools, you know, we can't, you know, um, our public defender, Patricia, has, has indicated that, you know, this is not a problem that we can solve as a juvenile court in the justice system, right? This, is, this takes a lot more than that. And this is a little bit of why we're having this conversation to get more people in on this problem solving. And um, we, we have been seeing an increase in guns as, as we've all agreed. And, and there's, there's children who are in school. And what, what is your response to this? And, and is there, you know, how is the court working with the schools or the schools working with the court? And, and what are your thoughts on this? Well, um, we, we have seen a, a bit of an uptick of, of children having school or guns in the areas of school. Um, I think we're very fortunate that we haven't seen uh, any shootings occur in a school building. Um, most of what we've seen have been kids taking pictures or kids having them in their backpack because they, you know, uh, allegations of being afraid and, and all of that. I, I, I I, I, I was listening to Pat and I, I was thinking about how our kids are bombarded with, you know, everybody has the right to have a gun, everyone should have a gun. You see uh, people in Congress who refuse to give their gun up while they go into the chambers where they're not supposed to have them. And I, I really wonder what message we're sending to our children. It, it's, it's almost a do as I say, not as I do kind of, of message, which is very concerning. 
So um, to get to the question about uh, do we work with the schools, we have a, a very good relationship with the Akron Public Schools and uh, we um, have developed a program that kind of took a little bit of a breather during COVID simply because the kiddos weren't in the building, uh, but that gives the school resource officers the ability to refer kids that they believe are troubled to our family resource center so that an assessment can be done. So if a child needs chemical dependency treatment, if a child needs uh, mental health um, uh, treatment and that family doesn't know where to go, that the, that the uh, staff at the Family Resource Center can help uh, uh, um, guide them to the resources that they need to try to nip those things in the bud. So um, I know that the, the, the school resource officers that are in the school have a very close relationship with the director of that program and feel comfortable to reach out to them. Now, obviously, if somebody's committed a serious offense like having a gun in school, uh, they find their way to Dan Street, most likely in the back of a paddy wagon, and we try to sort out after, uh, afterward uh, you know, what the, the threat of harm was and what we need to do to pack around that kid in a much more serious way. Uh, but I, I will say that we, we do work very closely with the schools to try to solve some of these uh, problems. Is it, is it hard, Judge, to distinguish when you, when you have the, one of the students and the kids in front of you, is it hard to distinguish between where that kid falls in these three groups that we've immediately, you know, recognized here? Well, you know, of course, and you know, I what I, I think is important that everybody knows is that as a youth comes into the juvenile court, we're not making a decision about that youth on the same day. Uh, my policy is that if a child comes in on a gun charge, that we hold them in detention until we can gather some more information. That includes doing some kind of assessments, interviewing parents, uh, finding out um, you know, what their uh, history is, uh, trying to determine whether they can be released to a parent or guardian uh, on a GPS monitor with close and consistent supervision. Uh, but that is a process that takes a great deal of time and is done with great care so that if we do release a youth from detention prior to their dispositional hearing, we have a lot of good information about where they came from uh, and, and what their background is and what their intents were. We look at all of that. So, um, you know, certainly the first appearance, uh, unless it's been a youth that we've been familiar with, it's been through the court before, we don't have a lot of that information. But we do work very, very hard to gather it and work together with family and other supports in the community uh, to try to lift that child up and, and, and move them away to a more productive lifestyle. And, and Don, Don, Donovan, can you please tell us what your thoughts are on this? Because you're seeing, you know, students come, you know, after the fact, probably right after, you know, Judge Teodosio would, would have them before her. Um, adjudicate that child. What what are you seeing? Do you, are you able to recognize you know the three categories, and are you able to see you know are you seeing the guns in the schools as we've just talked about? I believe the the difference in what I see than what maybe the judge sees or prosecutor or the public defender is I get the, I get a chance because of the ministry I work at South Street Ministries, and me and uh, my coworkers in the reentry department. Uh, South Street Ministries Reentry Services, we have uh, intentionally decided to try to reach out to, to the youth that are closest to the problem, or by, by a lot of intentions, the youth that are the problem. So we are bringing some of the, some of the would-be shooters or some of the, some of the people who are seen as the critically at-risk youth, and we sit down at the table with them, which I think a lot of times is overlooked. We usually uh, want to talk to them after they catch a case. We want to talk to them after they are in trouble, but we don't sit down and talk to them and say, what can we do to help you right now? And, uh, and one of the biggest failures, we always talk about our successes uh, as a people, but I will say one of my biggest failures was, was uh, me and Lamar had, had these two young men in and, and we, we helped them to dream and we helped them to think and we helped them to get a vision and we told them, okay, you go, you, you go away, you write us a plan. And when you come back with the plan, we're going to do everything we can do to help you reach this plan. And then we ran downstairs and we asked Joe Tucker, our executive director, like, if they come with a plan, can we hire them? Can we support them? What can we do? And everything was so excited and we, and we were so happy because Joe said yes. And then two days later, both of them were in jail for murder. Ah. So the, 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 the failure in that, you know, the, the, 
oh my God, we reached these two young men that we know are, we know they're shooters and we know they're out here causing havoc in the community and we got a chance to change their lives and maybe we can put them close to some of the resources that are available that everybody's talking about, let's open a community center or let's do this or let's do that. But nobody's going to these kids and asking them, what do you want? What can we do? How can we help you? And then as soon as we got an opportunity to do it and, and we've done it a lot more since then, we didn't allow that failure to, to, to deter our mission. But as soon as we got a chance and we got people on board, it, we weren't in time to save these two young men's lives. And now, and, and now in all intents and purposes, they, they will probably be gone for the next 30 years. So- Donovan, do you think it was just timing? Yes. And I think society doesn't have anything in place to catch these critically at-risk youth before they get to where the time is up. Mm -hmm. And then we look back once the time is up and we say, we should have, we would have, or we could have did something so much better. Let's take some money and open a community center. And that doesn't work. Rhonda, what do you think? Because I know that you, you, you frequented community centers. I mean, you talk about that in your bio, your children have as well. Um, and, and you were there, you, you spoke to your son. What, what do you think about what Donovan just said? I think it's critical that we create the space, not just for the youth, but for their families. I'm a product of those organizations, those agencies. Um, and back in the day, you know, we got dropped off at places or, you know, we caught the bus places. But me as a parent, it was my commitment to my children to engage. Um, in the activities and, and with the uh, organizations that they were involved in to have those uh, tough conversations with them. Um, I also made space for their friends to come have that conversation. So I think that's critical that they have people around them that give them that safe space. And to Donovan's point, I think it's a, a, a matter of too late, but also what do we send them back into? You know, you sent them to come up with a plan, but the environment they went back into, they they had to you know, go and be around in that space. And then the result was that they did the things that they do in that space. So you gave them the opportunity, you gave them probably lit the fire under them, but they had to go back to those say, same unsafe spaces. So I think that's where it starts. That societal, societal problem starts with the initial environment. And I think that's where the failure is. The programming that we use for the youth, are we engaging their parents? Are their parents able to become involved? Um, because a lot of those parents are single family homes. Um, they're uh, impoverished and they can't miss work, you know, and if they're in school, they can't miss school because they, you know, their schools are funded. Um, so we, we got to look at how can we create that space and those opportunities for them to engage with their kids, with their youth, and not have them risk their livelihood. Pat, I'm going to turn to you. Do you think that by the time, you know, you, you are representing um, the juveniles, do you think that you're representing them and you've hit that point in time where it's too late? I never think it's too late. And okay. I think that's kind of the beauty of my job is that I never think it's too late. And I want to give credit to a lot of people on this screen because I want to say a juvenile court, we do ask children, what do you need? And sometimes we say it just like that. What do you need? What aren't you getting? What can we help you with? And we actually did a program, Reimagining Probation, and we met a lot at juvenile court. And that was one of the major things we talked about, like, what can we do for you? We have a parent project and parents who go through it speak so highly of it. They really think that it's very helpful. A lot of times both parents go through it. Um, we have wonderful counseling programs. So I really feel you can never give up. And I know the judge will say this, but we have kids, I mean, I've been a lawyer over 40 years. I've seen a lot of people come and go through the system, but a lot of times they come back and they come to juvenile court and they say, thank you. Thank you for what you did for me. Thank you for the program you put me in. Even if they get sent away, they come back and say, thank you. So I think there's always help and hope. And I'm, I'm personally opposed to mandatory bind over of juveniles. I think that there should be discretionary bind over and that bill is pending in the legislation right now, I think. But um, I think there's always hope. And I think that 
DYS, even though we don't like to send kids there, they actually have good programming. You talk to kids that come out of DYS, they're like, I learned this, I learned that. We use a lot of alternatives to DYS. And again, you talk to the kids, they'll talk about what they learned in counseling. So these are kids, and I always tell people, I live in Akron, I live in South Akron. So I don't live in some fancy suburb. This is my neighborhood. These are my neighborhood schools. I live in the Kenmore Garfield School District. So these are like my neighbors, my kids. And I think that's really important to say is that I live in this community, I work in this community and I see the problems that the community has. So the answer to the question was, do I ever not have hope? I always have hope. And I have kids sitting right now in Summit County Jail on adult charges that I still talk to because we do kind of build relationships with them and we do try to give them hope and talk to them. And I actually, I remember the cooler ban it so well. And um, I always think of Annette Powers. I just have to say that because I know Annette had one of them and um, she's still a very good friend of mine. And we, we do build relationships. And I think that's an important part of what we do here. So I always have hope. Maureen, can you tell us, you know, you and I have had a lot of conversations about this, you know, over bindovers, you know, the, the, the kids that you're, you're seeing um, as a prosecutor. Can you shed a little bit of light and maybe respond a little bit to what Pat has said? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I, I've talked to the judge, I've talked to Pat, I've talked to, you know, Sherry and you a lot about these issues. And I really wanted to listen a lot to everybody and particularly to Rhonda Hawkins and to um, Donovan Harris. I really wanted to hear what they say. You know, and I heard Donovan just talk about those two kids that he saved or wanted to save that ended up um, now facing murder charges. I got to tell you about the heartbreak on the other side. And that's the two kids that came in like um, Ms. Hawkins' son on gun charges. And they were maybe on their first or their second time with gun charges. And, you know, we talk about the inability to identify those at-risk kids. And I got to say, there's a lot of ways to identify them, um, either through the police departments who know these kids, neighborhoods that know these kids, teachers that know these kids. There are ways to identify some of the kids that are very at, at risk. And what I heard is, you know, how long ago, you know, Mr. Harris, you were involved with the system when that started, or Ms. Hawkins, your son. And I think about the cases recently of kids that were in on gun charges and then ended up dead before they even got to their first hearing, review hearings. And I think, what did we miss? You know, and, and it's not that we caused them to be dead, either the judge by the decisions or the defense attorney. I, I sit there and I think, what could I have done or asked for more. And I beg a lot in court, as I think Judge Titi Dosia will tell you about, I beg, you know, what can we do? And I know she struggles as much as everybody struggles is trying to find an answer, but her kids are dying. So to talk about the, the gun culture, I get it. And I get what Ms. Melhoff is saying, but I can't say that that's a reason for us to stop either really seeking a way because it's the kids that are being harmed. And when I look at what I do and I think about, you know, mandatory bind overs and what does that mean? I also think about the fact that there are real victims and victims families that have been destroyed um, through a single act that yes, somebody was young when they committed it, but that has a devastating effect, effect upon the juvenile's family that's charged, the victim's family that deals with the loss, the court personnel that often know the juvenile because he's been in the system. And then you hear one day that he's dead and it's somebody else that you know that's involved in a rival gang that we all know, we can identify them. And I think we have to really find a way to pay attention or, or to really identify those kids when they come in on that gun charge, you know, and not just say, okay, they're afraid. You know, we know that guns are being hidden around the school. You know, we know that. And we try to get and find it and try to get those guns. And, and we can't change the gun culture, we can't. But when the kids come into juvenile court, you know, I really think that that is a touch point that even if they're on their first gun charge where they're saying they're afraid, we have got to pay attention, you know. Um, and I look at the mandatory bindovers and I'm kind of reading about, hey, my kid was 15 and he went over or, you know, I got to tell you, I had two 10 year olds charged with gun charges. They were 10. 
And one of them brandished a gun against a seven-year-old. You know, it, it, the, the effects are so devastating that I'm really looking to find a better way to identify high-risk kids when they come in on that first gun charge and not just give them the standard, you know, what I consider the standard, and I know nobody wants to call it that, but the, this is his first time. We don't want to do too much. We don't want to do too little, just to try to figure out a way. And, and I know this is no more an issue or less an issue to Judge Teodosio or Pat Milhoff than it is to me as a prosecutor. I know that because I see them in court every day with these children. And I know the Ms. Hawkins and the people that have dealt with that. And I know the Mr. Harris's, you know, that are ending up going away for years. I know them because I do work in juvenile court. We see them grow up and to hear the exact same pattern that we're seeing now, it's heartbreaking to me. Maureen, you bring up, you know, you bring up a good, good point. You're talking about you know, the severity of these crimes, right? And that, that you're seeing that the judge, that all of the panelists are seeing. And I, I think I'm gonna turn this conversation a little bit to Judge Teodosio. You know, how do you, how do you balance, you know, that victim's right, you know, and their need, their need for safety and, and that seriousness of the crime that, you know, Maureen was just talking about with, you know, what we were just talking about prior to that is that rehabilitation of the defendant and giving that defendant hope. So it's, it's very much a balancing of, 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 of a victim and, and that seriousness of the crime versus that rehabilitation. How do you, how do, you do that? Well, I mean, it, it's certainly not easy. Let me, let me say that. I, I mean, I, when I was talking about treating those kids that are afraid differently than those kids that commit a serious offense, let me assure you, I wasn't talking about, you know, slapping the, the kid who's afraid on the wrist, the wrist and sending him along. We have a program of cognitive behavioral therapy, thinking for a change, where they engage with groups to uh, try to figure out how to make better choices, maybe avoid areas where they might feel that they need to uh, carry a gun if that's possible. Um, we have a, a, a very robust reentry program where we try to get kids employed, if we can keep them busy doing something productive, they'll have less time than that. But when it comes to the very serious offenses where someone has been injured or uh, heaven forbid, uh, lost their life as a result of gun violence, that, that really dictates that there be an appropriate consequence for that youth. And you know, we have several youth in the Department of Youth Services that committed offenses at a very young age that will be there until their 21st birthday, which is the extent of the juvenile court's jurisdiction over a child uh, to do the consequences of that act. Um, they have uh, uh, blended sentences, which means that if they're not successful or if they commit an offense of violence while in the Department of Youth Services, the state can come back and ask that an adult sentence be imposed. It's kind of given those kids the last opportunity to make the most of it. But I'm a firm believer, uh, and I, I do this in my detention center, and I know it happens in the facilities run by the Department of Youth Services, that while they're in my building, it's not going to be dead time. Uh, we are going to be putting programming in place. We have therapists available at the juvenile court detention center. We have outside groups coming in and providing information to these youth. Uh, we have several mentoring programs. So um, I, I think that... Um, that one without the other doesn't work. You have to have a consequence and it's gotta be a consequence that fits the offense that was committed. But you've got to couple that with what services does this kid need? What are the, what is the missing puzzle piece? You know, one of the things we talked about was poverty. We talked about mental health. We talked about substance use. And my, um, my program that we, uh, that we run, uh, the, our BHJJ program that we run that provides intensive in-home counseling uh, for children, over 50% of those youth have been involved with the child welfare system. So, you know, there are a lot of problems. These kids bring a lot of trauma and baggage to the, uh, to the table when they come in our doors. And I think that, you know, trying to find the important balance of um, consequence and uh, rehabilitative programming becomes so very, very important. And I, for one, am so grateful to the victims that uh, continue. It's gotta be heartbreaking but the victims that continue to come to the hearings and express their opinions and let that youth know that they are watching and, and they want to know that they're making the most of their opportunities. I think that goes a long way for those youth too, to have that direct accountability to their victim. 
Um, and um, again, I am, I am very appreciative of the victim services officers that work with the prosecutor's office because they do such a fine job of bringing those voices uh, to the court, even if the, the victim, uh, for whatever the reason, prefers not to be present themselves. So I hope that answers. Oh, it definitely. I know it's a very, it's a very hard question, and and as you you've expressed, that's definitely a, a difficult balancing. And you know, I'm going to turn to Rhonda a little bit here because Rhonda, I think you had to balance too. I mean, you lost your son. Can you can you express a little bit of, of how you felt at the time? I mean, especially you who who has been involved in other organizations that work with the community and work with kids, um, you know, to bring sports and bring activities into their lives. How did you balance? you know, you lost your son and then there's another kid in front of you, um, you know, who's, who's, who's gonna be spending life in prison. So the one thing that I, you know, I spent a lot of time sitting on the, the benches in uh, court for three different trials. Um, from a, a, a parent perspective, from a victim perspective, um, I did a lot of observing. And for me, because of the uh, commitment I had to the community and the community youth, I wanted to see what their family interaction was like. And you could tell the difference between, you know, some of the defendants and their, their supporters that came in um, and some of them that had their grandmother sitting there every day in the same spot, you know, refusing to move, refusing to go get something to drink or go to the restroom. And my family, um, we wanted to support them as well. And, and, and as crazy as it sounds, you know, they're my people, you know, and their, their, their son was, you know, on trial um, and he looked like my son. And so that mother, you know, could have been me the next go around. And so we, we took that into consideration. And, and so it's a very um, difficult position to be in. It's a very conflicting internally. Uh, position to be in because I care so much for the youth and I care so much for that community. Like I said, I'm from East Akron um, and those people are my people. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I represented my son and he got justice, uh, but I also wanted to be um, considerate and, and caring towards the, the families that were there supporting, you know, their sons, um, their grandsons. Uh, because I know they were they were suffering a loss as well. Um, my son's never going to come back, but there it's going to be a long time before they can see their their son without a piece of plexiglass between them. If they could, you know, afford to take the time off of work if they work or had the funds to go travel to see them wherever they are. Um, so it was a loss um, as well. Different, definitely, but it was definitely a loss. So I had to consider all of that. Um, as I sat there, you know, that's pretty much all I could say. I mean, being the, the person that I am and the commitment I have, um, I couldn't just sit there and, and, and feel bad for myself and my family without considering, you know, the impact to the other person on the, so on the other side. Rhonda, you're talking, you're talking about the impact. It kind of makes me think about what Donovan had said. And I, I tried to write it down. I don't know if I wrote it down correctly, Donovan, you said something about, you know, the offenders, not only, they said, they think, you know, not only do they not mean anything to them, but you don't mean anything to me either, right? And do you think when, you know, what do you think having a victim in that room does? Does it show the offender, you know, well, you, there is, you may mean something to me, or there is a person on the other side, or do you think it takes a lot longer than that? I think, uh, Listening to you do a great job moderating. I just want you to. Know, really <laughs> you might need. I you may need to say that quote again. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, uh, listen, listening to uh, listening to the panelists, I think the one a uh, couple of things are missing. One, uh, we talk about rehabilitation, and I think what I'm more more dedicated to at this point in my life is to catch them before they even have to be rehabilitated. How do you re how do you rehabilitate somebody who's never been habilitated? You know what I mean? I think uh, for myself, I was 16. I was one of these young guys carrying a pistol. I was one of these young guys committing crimes. I was one of these young guys. I didn't, I didn't see myself being anything. I didn't, I didn't see a future for myself. I didn't see hope. I didn't have, 
help. I didn't have opportunity and I came from a great family. I came from a mother who works herself to death for me and my sister. I came from a family where my uncle was a pastor and I grew up in the church to a, to a certain degree. As soon as they told me I didn't have to go no more, I was out of there. But anyway, uh, I think uh, I, was, I was one of those youth and what we got to realize is a lot of time, the powerlessness that comes with being a, a misguided, uh, a at-risk youth, even, even though I was never critically at risk, the powerless that comes from that, you put a pistol in my hand and now I feel power. Mm. Now I feel empowered. Now I feel like I matter. I mean something. I feel like I have the ability to move something because I have this pistol in my hand. I see a lot of people in the in the chat asking where do they get these pistols from. It's sad, but in our community, you can get a pistol quicker than you can get a burger. It's, it's, it's no problem going out somewhere and getting a pistol. It's not no specific place. I don't go to the local corner store and say, hey, give me a pistol. But I might go somewhere similar to that and say, hey, give me a pistol. So it's, 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 it's the power the power that comes with that. And then when we talk about the victim, I went, to, I went to prison at 18. I walked straight across the stage of North High School into a prison cell. So I was 18 when I graduated and I was 18 when I was in prison. And I stayed in prison for the next 13 years. I was sentenced to 16 to 50 years. And I came home and, and, and by the grace of God, I've been home almost 20 years now. And I think uh, the, the biggest impact was we showed the Cooler Bandits documentary at, at uh, the library, Summit County Public Library. And one of our victims was there and she walked up to me after it, after it was over. And she said, the life you are living now is your apology for what you did to me. And I think that was the most impactful thing to show. My transition wasn't something that I could talk about. It wasn't something that I could tell. I couldn't go to everybody and say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But the life I lead is my apology for the crimes I committed. And a lot of us have to realize when we go back to that whole habilitation before rehabilitation, a lot of the funding and a lot of the a lot of the the, the emphasis is on the programs that exist professionally. But in our communities, we have programs. For instance, we have Gino Tony. He ha he has he has the peace homes, and 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 I see this I see this man coming out of his pockets, and I see him feeding families, and I see him teaching kids how to box, and I see parents giving their kids to him when they are at risk. They're not giving them to a, a professional program. It's not a psychological degree that's there. It's, hey, man, you have been there. You have been one of these kids. So can you help my son not end up in prison? People come to me and Lamar all the time to mentor their kids. Can you help my son not become you? And then we have all of these resources up here. And I say it's kind of like the resources fly over the community and they drop the resources and they end up in the trees and the community that's under the trees never get the resources. And down here where the resources should be, where you got Gino teaching kids how to box and teaching young men how to become men, he never gets the resources that he may need that can really help him change the lives of these young men. So I think the biggest thing we need to do is we, we need to figure out ways that we can support people that are committed to habilitating our youth before we have to rehabilitate them. And I think another thing, and then I'll stop because I can talk forever. Another thing I'll say is I went to, I went to prison at, at, at 18 and I went to prison with all of this, all of this stuff, all of this mess, all of this, they call it post-traumatic stress. And I went into prison with all of this on me and I was in there for 13 years. So I gathered all of this other stuff while I was incarcerated. All of this stuff was on me. And then I was released after 13 years and I was, I was turned loose in society. My mental health was very, very, very fragile. I had all this post-incarceration syndrome is what it's called on me. And I was put here in society and I was told, we offer you all of this, a job, transportation, and a place to live and you should be okay. But meanwhile, I am not okay. People coming home are not okay. Our mental health is not okay. So if I'm coming home in my thirties and I got all the post-traumatic stress that I went with and I got all the post-incarceration that I came home with and I'm put here to say I'm okay in my thirties, imagine a young man that's put there at 13 or 14, he returns at 21 and society saying, you're okay. Our kids are not okay. So what do we do to change that? We start to support the people who are closest to the problem like Gino Tony, like, oh, I said, it's a million programs I can name, but he just comes to mind because I see him doing the work daily. Did I answer your question? You sure did, Donovan. Okay, thank you. I was taking notes. <laughs> um, you know, we have four more minutes. I want to give 
to before we start going into questions from we've got a lot of comments in the chat i don't know you know with our presenters if you've been able to catch some of those there have been been a lot of great comments and i want to get into their questions but um i want to hear you know from maureen and pat just you know a couple of your thoughts you know donovan just shared a lot and a lot of it you know is is getting those resources to the kids you know before um you know what what are you thinking like last thoughts what can be done i mean i know you guys are seeing these these kids after so um what are your last thoughts before we go into questions from the audience you can go first marie okay so um a couple things one um that i want to say that i think um judge teodosio is um very impressive first of all is um her making sure that trauma therapy goes to the children that come before her. Um, and that is a huge part of what she does when she looks at every one of these children that comes before her. The other thing that I think she does very well is um, her treatment of victims. And what I'm very appreciative is, is that she reviews every case that a kid is incarcerated um, about every 30 to 45 days. And she creates a space for victims to come either themselves by Zoom, through our victim advocates or through myself. Um, and allows us to speak on behalf of the victims and to tell them, I think in almost every case where there's a victim that they cannot change what they did, but they can choose to lead a life after this in a way that honors the memory of that victim. Um, and I think the most powerful cases that we have seen are those that the victims themselves take a, an opportunity to come. And um, for a year, a year and a half, two years, sometimes three years and be part of that and be able to join in that conversation. And I, I thank Judge Tito Huseo for allowing, and I know it's probably required, but she creates a safe space for them to do that and she honors them. Um, the other thing I want to say is while I recognize that, yes, there's a lot of stuff as a community that we can do pre this, the court is crisis. These are people that have come to our court after that. And I'm not willing to ignore either the possibility of hope for them to find a way and not say that it's too late, or in those cases where I believe, based upon my experience and my knowledge of a juvenile or a crime, that we cannot, um, the risk to the community is far too great to just say, okay, we're going to try while before he gets to 21. There are some cases where there just is not the time period for that to happen, in which I've got to ask um, for him to be transferred to the adult system, either because of the violence of the crime or because we have run through everything that the juvenile court knows to do. And, and I don't, I, I used to always look at that as a loss um, and I still do in many ways to the community because you lose a young man in that way. But now I've just known too many young men who have died um, either, either um, with gun violence or who have lost their lives, basically a good portion of it because they're incarcerated forever. Not to say that that is a choice that in some ways at least still holds out hope because that hope is time. You know, so sometimes I ask for, um, residential or incarceration because the risk is so great, not just to the community, because that is a true risk, but also to the juvenile himself, because if he's 16 and 17 and he uses a gun, he's going to prison. You know, it's a mandatory bind over. And even in those cases where it's not a mandatory bind over, the odds are, even if it was discretionary, most of those young men would end up in prison um, because of the um, harm was so great. In, in, um, in, in that victim element, the community safety element has got to be part of the court um, decisions uh, because it's not, there's an effect. You know, if a young man is, has um, harmed somebody, that victim lives with that harm and has to go through that for the rest of their lives. You can't take back having a gun pointed in your face. You can't. And somebody may not have died as a result, but that fear will always be a part 
of that victim and that victim's family. So um, I, I like to say we can concentrate on the before, but we also have to concentrate on these kids that are in crisis mode right now. Thank you for that, Maureen. Pat, do you have any last thoughts yeah. before we go? Yeah, just questions? a couple of thoughts I wanna say. You asked what we can do, and I wanna stress again, we do have the Family Resource Center and anyone can go to that at any time. Schools can refer, anyone can refer. But you said, what can we do? And I have always said, and we have met about this, take it to the streets. And I mean that in the most possible way. I think we need boots on the ground. And that's why Gino Tomi and his boxing program or Mr. Anderson and Fallen Fathers, we have a lot of programs in this community and they are people who are literally on the street. So big brothers, big sisters, church programs, I think those are a big part of the preventative factors. So we know what the risk factors are. We can look at the end again at the bottom of the river, but I think we really need to be talking about what we can do in our community to catch these kids before they're at the deep end. And that's what we call, we talk about deep end kids, the kids who have come more than once. And But I think we really do have wonderful people in our community. We have wonderful programs. I know the city of Akron just allocated over a million dollars to programs. And I think that's a big part of the answer. And I think it doesn't have to be a lawyer, somebody with an MSW after their name. I think the real connection with these kids are people that they can connect with. And that's why you know, these programs are so important. And I just wanna thank the people who give their time to rehabilitating these kids when it's not really their job. I think that's one of the most important things we can do. And that goes to hope and love, which is really what we're talking about here. You know, we can say to these kids, I love you, I want a good life for you. And that's that's what I want, thank you. Hey, Tanya, if I could thank you. Thank you. Just for one second, you know, and um, I just want to point out because the judge mentioned some things too um, about the community and community leaders such as Judge Tedosio and and our prosecutor um, Cherry Bevan Walsh is that um, that victim advocacy group, the victim advocates here that the judge has spoken about, that is a program that has really been highlighted by um, Sherry. That you know every victim comes in there has individuals that help with that. And, and also um, what to do after you've been victimized and, and the way that all of us are taught, trained to um, never forget, never forget a victim that's come in. And, and so when I talk about Judge Tito, so I wanna say that it's like Judge Tito, so Sherry, you know, you have really listened to like the Donovan Harris's and the Rhonda Hawkins um, and, and really have emphasized that. And I have to say, you know, that victim piece is, is such a, um, you know, often we talk about juveniles and we forget about the juvenile victims. And I know we don't, but I got to say that those two um, women have really done something to make sure that that we don't forget the victims of violent crime. And so that kind of brings us, that kind of brings us to, to one of the questions in the chat. Uh, Maureen, you're talking about, let's, you know, let's make sure we don't forget, you know, the victims that we're working with here. Um, and Pat, you talked about, let's take this to the streets. Uh, you know, Charles had asked a question and, and Maureen and Pat, you were kind of, you know, inching towards this that, you know, Charles asked a question that said, to what degree and with what purpose is the public educated about the severity of the gun problem with our children? And I'm going to open this up to our panel. Um, what do you, I mean, do you think, you know, that our, our community is, is educated in this? Or do you think that just those resources, you know, that we heard from um, all of you speak of, you know, a few, a few names that those are the only ones that this is, that they're really focusing in on this. I think that, um, first of all, I could always have more inf information about the people that are on the street helping these kids. You know, we have a family resource here um, at the court that I think is very informed about some of the things. You know, but um, I think that we really need to do a job. I'd love to see people at juvenile court sometimes just when these kids walk in and walk out, you know, with the family members. And I know that there are court personnel that do that, but I'd really love to somehow connect more with the people that are actually living the lives. When you say, is the public educated? I say back to you, the public is living this. I mean, you can't be in Akron and not know of these issues. You just cannot. It's in our news, it's in our schools. 
you know, our children know about this. Um, like I said, I had 10 year olds that are charged, you know, with brandishing weapons. You know, we've we've lost 17 year olds. We've lost 15 year olds. Our neighborhood knows. The question is, um, gosh, how do we get the people that actually live the lives and have lived this? And then there they can connect in a way a little bit different than just professional saying, hey, try this. So we you have know? someone here. I mean, we have Donovan who's, yes. who's lived this, right? That's why I wrote his name about, down. Donovan, you talked about, you know, how when you got released, you know, you still had the, you know, that mental aspect that, that was not dealt with. Um, but somehow, look, here you are. You're an accomplished man. You're sitting here. You're educating us on, on, on how to make our community a little bit better. Wh what was it that that took you from there to here? Do you, is there, I'm going to guess there wasn't a magic wand, but <laughs> I want to hear from you, maybe your thoughts, if you thought about it, like why me, why, why, why have I made it this far and other people haven't? I think uh, kind of go back to what Ms. Walsh had talked about. Uh, I don't, I, I know our community understands what's going on, but a lot of times statistics don't matter until they affect you directly. So a lot of times the, the statistics can say one thing, but until it directly affects me or my household, it doesn't matter to me. And I think if our community realized that more kids, teenagers age one through 19 die from gun violence than die from car accidents, gun violence is the number one killer of our children right now. I think if they understood that, that our children are more likely to die from gun violence than they were during the, the height of the COVID epidemic, I think that would start to really shake a lot of people and rattle a lot of people and get them to understand that we are dealing with a, a, a crisis of our own. This is an epidemic and it needs to be addressed just like we address other epidemics. It needs to be addressed on all levels from the, from the ground up, from the top down. It needs to be talked about. It needs to be addressed. But I'm going to stop on that part and go back to your question. I think uh, the, the, the thing that when I first came home, I felt like nobody could speak about incarceration, but people that have been incarcerated. So every room I stepped into, every opportunity I got, I would say, you don't know what you're talking about because you've never been there. You don't you don't have a right to feel like that because you've never been locked up. And then I was having a conversation with my mom and she was telling me that she did every single day of my incarceration with me. And it crushed me to think about not what I did to myself, but what I did to my mother, what I did to my sister, what I did to my little cousins, the people who looked up to me. They did every single day of that with me, 13 years straight. And that was that was kind of the, even though I came home feeling like, okay, I'm not going back to prison, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. It was the moment when I realized how much I actually hurt my mom that changed my life. So when you get, when, when you get out, you have to have a reason to stay free. You have, you have to have a reason to be out here. You have to have a purpose for being on this side of those, those bars. If you don't find a purpose to stay out here, you end up back. And that's when the whole recidivism thing and the revolving door kick in. If I don't have a reason to wake up every morning, you know, at first it was my mom. I wanted to make my mom proud of me. I wanted to prove to my mom that I deserved every ounce of love she gave me while I was incarcerated. I wanted to do anything I could to make my mom smile. And then I had a son and it became him. And then I had a daughter and it became him and her. And then one day I realized it's nothing to do with none of that. It's me. The only thing that you could talk about everything in the world that the only thing that puts me back in prison is me, my choice, my decision, my thoughts, my actions. Society doesn't lock me back up. I lock myself back up. And once I came to the realization that my purpose was just to help somebody, you know, I wake up every day and I walk in the purpose of helping people. I want to give help, hope, and opportunity to the people. And I walk, it, it don't matter if you're one year old or 99 years old. I want to connect you with the resources that are in this community that can help make tomorrow a little bit better than today was. And if I can go to sleep every night feeling like I did that, then I'm walking in my purpose. So I think, you know, finding a purpose is, is when, when, I, when I found my purpose was when I realized, you know, I had really been restored. We go from incarcerated, we go reentry, we go redirection, we go restoration. And I feel now I sit here as a restored citizen. That's how I sit on this panel. That's why I feel like I can bring some enlightenment because I feel I have been restored. I feel like daily I prove to society that I deserve the spot I occupy. 
And I think uh, that answered your question. So let me stop before I keep You going. did. Good job, Donovan. I appreciate that. Um, we know we have a question here from Rebecca that says, as a foster parent, I'm curious if you see a higher percentage of at-risk youth coming out of the foster care system. I feel like Donovan hit the nail on the head when speaking of hope and love, and it's all too common to see our foster care kids lacking those two key elements of development. I'm going to open it up to anyone on the panel. The statistics both in Summit County and nationwide uh, are very, very clear that youth that end up in foster care or involved with child welfare are at much higher risk to be involved with the, the delinquency system. Um, there are, we, uh, have had staff do a lot of education on that and we actually have a facilitator who tries to work with both the child welfare system and uh, court personnel and coming up with the best program possible for kids that are what we call duly involved youth that are involved in both foster care uh, and with the delinquency system. But you know, as I listen to Donovan, as I, I listen to the other panelists, I suppose that's not a, a surprise. And, you know, if you're if you end up being removed from your family of origin of the people that you care about, it's easy to understand how those kids could not have the same type of hope, perhaps, as someone who's in an intact family and hasn't suffered the trauma of being removed. Um, I, I think that. Uh, you know, we, we, we work really hard to help those kids, uh, to help them uh, get the counseling they need while they're in foster care. And I think that that's one way to work, uh, work through it. Um, but, you know, making those connections, having kids have relationships to people that they can relate to, um, finding those natural supports become very, very important. Uh, not only for kids in foster care, but across the system. I'm going to piggyback one more comment that I don't know that it's timely for this, but since I'm talking, I'm going to bring it up. Uh, you know, I think that it is it, it is not um, just a strange coincidence that we've seen an increase in, in gun cases, uh, both in Summit County and the state of Ohio and across the country during the time of COVID. I think many kids lost their anchors. Uh, you know, maybe it was the coach at their school who was the person that kind of pulled them along that kept them on the straight or, and narrow, or a particular teacher or a band leader or the club they went to after school that closed during COVID. So a lot of these kids became untethered from the natural supports that they have. And I think that we need to make the real effort to make sure that those kids get reconnected, uh, because I think that keeps a lot of kids from coming down this path. And, uh, you know, it's going to take a lot of work because they are they so many of them feel so isolated and the only folks they feel any connection to are those other kids on the street. And I think we really got to work with them to try to build up those connections so that those become strong and they, they don't end up in my building. So, Judge, I think you, you, you answered the other question here from Mark Gray that said schools are faced with the issues of youth anger and violence in our schools. What should we as educators know and do to better understand and be able to support our youth who are experiencing issues related to trauma due to the violence they have experienced in their home or are experiencing right now? Well, again, I you know don't mean to make it it's too simple, but I know uh, most of the school systems do have uh, work hand in hand with uh, licensed agencies that can provide uh, therapy there at the school. Um, but I, I would I, I think that our family resource center is 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 way underutilized. Um, folks can come in and they can say, um, I live in this neighborhood. I need my child to be able to go to a counseling agency that's close to me. I don't know, you know, who does that. I, you know, and and we try to maintain a very thorough list of all of the agencies that are available to help kids, to help parents, to help families. And uh, getting that referral uh, can go a long way. And, and it's not a matter of we make a referral and then case closed. They will continue to follow up with that family for up to six months or longer if they need the assistance. Mm -hmm. You know, did that agency work with you? If not, let's give something else a try. I mean, they really try to work with folks to get them connected. And for a, a lot of kids, uh, we know that anger is a symptom of depression. It's a symptom of anxiety uh, for young people. And I, I saw in one of the comments, you know, how do we erase the stigma uh, of that? Because 
you know, people feel that, that there is still that stigma for people with mental health disorders that need uh, counseling assistance. There's still, still the stigma that people don't want to admit to that. So how do we make that uh, a, an easy step for people to take so that they feel that they are really directing their own lives and getting the help that they need? So those are just some thoughts that I have is, you know, utilize the resources that are out there. The Family Resource Center is a great place to turn. You don't need to have a, a, a case. You can come in and ask for direction and they'll try to guide you to the most appropriate place where you can get some help. And they'll feed people, they'll give them other supplies too, if that's what they need. I think that's an essential fact that you just brought up is they don't need to have a case. And you know, a lot of times you'll hear people say you need to have a case to be put in the system to get the help that you need. And Judge Chido, so you just stated, you don't need to be in the system. You can just come to our Family Resources Center. Donovan's talking about resources in our community. I mean, we heard all of our speakers talk about resources that you're available without a case. Some, you know, and, and it's great because we're talking about local resources. This is a local panel. Um, Mika had put in the comments, she had asked, to what degree do you think, you know, that music and videos and games, you know, that aren't our local you know, situation, what, what effect do you think that they have on our kids that that's outside of our local resources and community? Well, I'll comment. Some of you know, I taught at Akron U for a long time. And so I'm kind of have a little academic background and I would say research is mixed on that. Um, you know, some people would swear that watching a video game where someone steals a car is going to make you a car thief. And, you know, we know that kids play those games their whole life and it doesn't happen. So I think it's mixed, but I think exposure to violence, whether real or imagined, is a factor. So if you live in a neighborhood where you're exposed to violence and gun violence, I think you react to that. If you grow up, again, where everyone acts like playing video games where people get murdered is normal, then I think there is some normalization of that. But I want to stress that I'm not saying playing video games equates to becoming a delinquent or a criminal. But there, you know, it is exposure to things. And I think we need to work on limiting our children's exposure. They are children and they are little sponges and they just, you know, sop everything that they're exposed to. And I think we need to be really careful. And that's where parents come in. You know, what are you letting your child be exposed to? And do you talk to them about this? I love some of those commercials that are on right now about drinking in a party and calling your parents. And I think that's the same about guns. I think if you have a kid in Akron Public Schools right now, you need to talk to them. And you need to say, you know, you might have an experience where someone has a gun or you hear someone has a gun and that we need to do what we can do to keep people safe. And I think speaking up is a big part of that. So, Rhonda, I see, oh, I'm sorry, Rhonda, I see you shaking your head a little bit. Um, can, you, can you maybe shed some light on that as a mother? Actually, um, I'm glad that came up because when my children were young, I refused to let them listen to certain music or watch certain uh, programs or even play video games that had the little warning on it. But that was me as a mother, as a, as a woman of faith. You know, I require, you know, certain things and, and behaviors in my home. Um, and even when they went elsewhere, you know, I gave strict instructions on what they were supposed to do. And, 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 and what they're supposed to listen to. Now, I also established a relationship with my children where we we could talk about anything, you know, the good, bad, the ugly, you know. And I shared earlier when my son came and told me, you know, that he had a firearm before I found out. So that was one of the rules in my house that if you tell me, <laughs> be a lot less consequences than if I found out on my own. Um, so I established that relationship with them where they, they felt safe to tell me anything, whether they thought I was going to be upset or not. Um, but limiting that, I, I don't think it contributes to whether or not they do that. But for me, exposing them too early for me as a parent, um, made me, un it, 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 it allowed me to control, uh, what, entered their ear gates and their eye gates. Um, so I controlled that and I felt it was important for me that once they once they got to a certain age, you know, they kind of broke loose and did whatever they wanted to do. But when they were under my roof, you know, they, they followed the rules. And I think that had a uh, impact on the decisions that they made. And, you know, they got exposure to those things when they were older and of age. Um, and then when they got to high school, you know, they went to parties and that type of thing. I couldn't control everything and everywhere they went. 
Um, but I, I believe, I, I want to believe that they heard my voice, you know, when those situations came up, when they listened to that stuff, they heard my voice. They even now, you know, as adults, you know, they know that there's certain things that they can play in mom's space. You know, they listen to what they want to listen to, but they recognize that they can't listen to those things in mom's space. So I think, you know, I ingrained that in them as youth and they hold on to that, especially when they're around me or adults, uh, other adults or adults that they have, you know, respect for that they don't, you know, they honor what I taught them. So you brought up can a good I, point I, about- Can I add something real quick about the music? I think uh, a lot of a lot of mistakes that some parents make, if you want to know what's on the mind of the youth, sometimes you have to listen to the music that they're listening to. Mm. I think my, my children are 16 and 15 right now. And my children like King Von and my children like Lil Durk and my children like uh, all of the hot music that's out. But the thing that, that makes it different is I sit there and I listen to it with my children. And I explain to my children what they're listening to. I try, I, I try to see what are what is the attraction to this for my children. See, if we could change the things that our kids are attracted to, if we could change the things that the, the things that motivate our children, if we can explain to our children what these artists are talking about, we could show them what this whole thing is about younger age, then when they get to a certain position, I never had nobody at 15 and 16 in my era was the ghetto boys, NWA. I never had nobody to sit me down and ask me what attracts you to listening to this? What is it in this that you connect with? And when I ask my children, like, do you know what they're talking about? What are they? Let's talk this through. Then I, I have no problem sending my kids into the, anybody that knows me will tell you my kids are two of the most respectable kids you'll ever see. And it's not that I come home and I, and I, you can't, it's just that I, that open line of communication, Miss Rhonda just talked about having that open line of communication where my daughter feels like she can ask me anything. My son feels like he can ask me anything. We can sit down and we can listen to whatever the hot new song is that's coming out. And I'm probably totally disgusted in my mind with what I'm listening to, even at my age and all I've been through, but seeing my daughter bop her head to it and then <laughs> be able to ask her, do you understand what they're talking about? And she has no idea. And then I can explain it as her father and the streets don't have to explain it to her. That's, 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 that's uh, I do think the music can have an effect if it's unchecked by adults who can explain to these children what they're listening to. And one other thing I'd like to say real quick and then I'll stop. Yeah. I think we have to stop referring to our children as them, they, those, as if they are the others. I think we have to use terms like we, our, mine. I see the people that I work with every day transitioning to say our people, my people. These are not clients, they're not participants. I understand as the judge and the prosecutor, we have to look at it a little differently. But I mean, as a society, we have to see people, we have to see our people as our people. I have to see these little boys that's walking up and down this street that may be considered critically at use. I have to see them as little Donovan. I have to see them as mine. If I don't see them as mine, then I can separate from them and not care about them. But if I see them as mine, then I can reach out to them because I'm embracing what I love, which is mine. All right, I'm done. I'm done. No, I appreciate that, Donovan. Thank you for that. I just wanted to share a couple things, like two things on that. One is about the music. Um, what I want to say is our city in Akron, the children, the gang members are using rap music to communicate. So parents should be listening to the music that their children are listening to because they are actually singing about murders. They're singing about drug deals. They're singing about associations. And I can't tell you the number of the parents that have come in of these children and said, that's just music. And I think, have you actually listened to it? Because if you go onto YouTube, you will see these videos and it is actually saying what is happening within our streets. We have to pay attention to that. And the other thing I wanted to say to Devon, Donovan and um, in some ways uniquely as a prosecutor, these are our children. This is our community. You know, prosecutors um, are supposed to take in everything um, I don't ignore the person that's sitting in that seat as a juvenile because he is a member of our community. And, and I don't ignore his needs because if I can get to a point and find something where he um, becomes productive, that is better for our community than locking him up. There I are times. Wayne, I think you may have said it best one time when we spoke. You said, 
you know, between the prosecutor, the public defender, the judge, and the advocates, everyone in that courtroom, the one thing we have in common is that these are our children. And I think you said it best that way. I actually wrote that quote down, just like I wrote Donovan's quote down when I spoke to you, you know, a few weeks ago. And so, you know, Pastor Harrison um, had, had a comment. He said, I had a son who was on the line of at risk, high risk. I had a very hard time trying to stay involved with my son because of custody. Domestic relation court should be a part of these conversations. And so he's not really asking a question, but he is addressing a little bit about what all of you, Maureen, you talked about, you know, we have, we have videos with guns in them and we need um, to have, you know, parents watching these. You know, Donovan, you said, listen to the music that your kids are listening to. Pat, you said, you talked about this too. You know, we're, we're talking about this, but then Pastor Harrison said, you know, what happens, what happens with domestic relation? You know, what happens when you can't stay involved? Or what happens when there's guns and you are involved in the guns in the videos? So that's a big, that's a kind of a double, you know, question there. Um, I don't know if anybody can, can shed a little bit of light on that. So I'm trying to understand the nature of your question, Tanya, about what do you do? Here's what I say. The worst thing to do is to do nothing, to not talk about it, to not reach out for help. I talk to parents all the time about if you're at the situation where you don't know what to do, that is the time that you turn to others. And it may be a police officer because it may save your, your son's life. You know what I mean? If there is a gun in your house, you need to talk to somebody. It may be um, that you go to Family Resource Center. It may be that you reach out to a Donovan Harris. The thing that you don't do is ignore it. It is the silence that is the worst of everything for a community, for a parent, for, for a child. To hide what is going on with your child does not help them. It just doesn't. You have, if you can't figure out the answer, your job as a parent, is to talk until you find somebody that can help you find a solution. Because if you're stuck, that's the time to reach out and ask for a hand. And that's what we're all here about. You know, whether it's a prosecutor, whether it's a defense attorney, whether it's a judge, whether it's a community member, whether it's a fellow victim that has gone through a loss that is unimaginable to anyone. You know, those are the people to ask. And if we don't have the answer, we're gonna search for it. I've not given up searching for answers. I don't think I ever will. And I don't think that anybody that's on this, this panel from Sherry to the judge, to Pat, to Donovan, to Rhonda, I think we're all here because we are desperate to help find solutions. You know, the, the road to prison is not what any of us want to see. The road to somebody dying is not. So my answer is, what do you do? You ask for help. And you Thank keep you. asking until you find it. So we're we're in our last minute, and I have 40 new messages that I haven't gone through in the chat. So I, you know, you know, I apologize to those who 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 have asked questions that we're not going to be able to get to. But this is not the last time we're going to have a conversation, a very important conversation with all of you, you know, about this issue. Um, I, I do want to end with some some last words from each of the panelists, and um, and and. You know, we are we're going to go a little bit over, but um, I think that, that all who are attending are okay with that. And, and I don't know if the panelists were able to see the comments, but there's a lot of comments cheering you all on for the work that you do. Um, so we appreciate all of you and what you do. So I'm going to start. I'm just going to go from left to right on my screen. Patricia, you're first. Um, you know, as a public defender, please, you know, give us the last last comments. Well, I want to say that. Some children who come to juvenile court are not guilty or not delinquent on any charge. And then I always want to say that, you know, we're talking here about the end of the line. And I want to say that children have rights and we are a juvenile justice system. And I think that's important to indicate. Having said that, I want to go back to the question you asked me, do I ever give up hope? No. And I think this is a very hopeful panel. I think everyone on here is filled with really good energy and good spirit, for lack of a better way of putting it, in that we need to keep talking. So thank you. I think this was a wonderful panel. Thank you, Patricia. Rhonda. Um, my final thoughts are, um, I just appreciate the opportunity to share um, with the community my perspective. Um, I do want to say to Donovan, one thing that really struck me was when you talked about how your mom did the time with you every day. 
um, just from a, the, a parent perspective and a victim perspective, um, I, I would like to see more opportunity for the, the victims or the parents of the victims to partner or at least interact with the parents or families, the support system of the defendants. Um, because we do that time with you every day as well. I'll just have to, I just want to say that watching um, the juvenile in, in my son's murder uh, go through the process, I could see, you know, where he started with the hardness and the walls up and the, you know, the, the, the staring, trying to stare the family down to where he became that little boy. You know, he became that little boy and my heart went out to him. And, I, you know, I think about him often and I pray for him all the time because I know being a juvenile in an adult prison has got to be the hardest thing that he's ever done in his life. No matter where he came from or what his experience was or his home environment, this has got to be the most traumatic thing that he's ever had to deal with. And I pray for his safety on a regular. Um, I know you know, my son is no longer here, but I can, I can pray coverage over that young man for, on his mother's behalf. So just know that as, as a victim and the mother of a victim that you, our, the defendants don't do the time alone, you know, because we're thinking about them, you know, one way or the other, because not everyone is like me. I, I recognize that. Um, but I do, do want you to understand that as victims, as victims' families, we do think about the defendants in these cases on a daily basis. That never goes away. Thank, thank you, Rhonda. Maureen, last words. So my last word is, is that um, I know we don't forget. I don't forget the victims and I don't forget the juveniles. And I don't forget those that are lost to juvenile court either through death or through prison. I don't forget them. And, and in being in this position, I get to know a lot of them. And, and each time that crime comes up, it affects me. And it's why I fight so hard, you know? And it's, I think it's why we all fight so hard because we can often see where this is going and are so desperate to find a way to stop it, which is why I think these panels are so important. You know, it, you know sometimes the prosecutors are look as if they're just, they're just prosecuting, you know, where we are, um, trying to give voice to often voiceless people that are victims and are just caught in a system through an action they never did. And also seeing the effects of a juvenile that has been through the system and is now ending up in a horrible position that I've gotten to know because I've been in the, all the specialty dockets trying to figure out a way to help. You know, And I have to say at the end of the day, I remember that it's not hopeless. There is still hope out there. Um, and so I listen to the to you know to you, Ms. Hawkins, and you, Ms. Rollins, who wrote in, in chat about your son, and to you, Donovan Harris, who have been to prison for a long time for committing crimes that had effects on people who you've now dedicated your life to helping that to keep others from stopping. And I, I have to say thank you. You know, thank you for being here and thank you for talking because we are all trying to find a solution. And thank you to Sherry, you know, for giving us an opportunity to actually have this conversation because our community, every time something happens, affects every one of us. And it is our children. It is, you know, and I never forget that when I'm in this courtroom, never. Thank you, Maureen, very much for being here as well. Judge Teodosio. Yeah, I'll, um, I, before I get to my last word, I'm, I'm hoping that um, Rhonda Hawkins will allow uh, you, uh, Tanya, to share her contact information with me because we are uh, trying to do some work to let uh, children hear a bit more from victims and victims' families. And if, you know, that's a difficult, difficult ask to make, but if it's something she's willing to do, boy, we'd love to, to welcome her. Um, um, but what I was going to say is so important to remember when you think about uh, hope, 
uh, is that uh, a lot of times our job in working with youth, it, you know, there's no magic wand that makes an immediate change in a child's life. Uh, I wish there were, but it's not as easy as that. Um, but I think the, the importance is, is, is persistence, is the, the continued reminder that we are there to support them. We want them to learn from their mistakes. We want them to be productive. Um, not to get into brain science, but we know that uh, people's brains don't mature at age 18. I think some of the studies show it can be late as 24 or 25 before a person's brain is fully developed. So I want you to remember that a lot of the work that we do is planting seeds. And, you know, fortunately, there are kids that have come back to the court and said, you know, when I was ready, I remembered what you told me and I was ready to make a change in my life. So we may not see immediate results, uh, but I, I know that the things that we say and do to try to help these youth is not for naught. And, and when the time is right, they are going to take advantage of that and we're going to see those seeds uh, grow and blossom. And I, I really believe that that's the case. Thanks for allowing me to be part of this panel. Thank you for being a part of the judge, Tidocio. Donovan, do you have any last words, closing statements? Um, first, I was I, I would like to say I, I really appreciate being a part of this. I really, I, I, I think a lot of people probably came in thinking it was gonna be a bunch of defense of the system and the programs and the organizations and how we are doing everything so perfectly. And to see people in positions of, of help and actually saying we don't have all the answers or we don't know what we don't know how to, you know, wave a magic wand and change everything. I think that was powerful and it, it's very impactful for our people to see. I think uh, in closing, I would just like to say, uh, I think we have, we have to we have to teach our children to dream. We have to bring back the ability to dream to our kids. And in order for our kids to be able to dream, we have to help them find hope. You have to have hope in, their, in, in order to be able to dream. And in order to have hope, you have to feel safe. You have to feel safe in order to have hope, which will give you the ability to dream. And at the end of that, in order to have hope and be able to dream and feel safe, you have to feel loved. We have to, we have to bring the love back, be it spiritually, be it whatever. We have to, to, to love on our kids. And I say our kids, like I said earlier, all of our kids, we got to bring that back. Teach our put our children in position to dream again, because a lot of our kids are not safe. They don't have hope. They don't feel love. Therefore, they have no dreams. Thank you, Donovan. And I, I you know, just to piggyback off of that, um, not only are we listening and taking notes to what our panelists are saying about our kids, um, we're also taking notes in the chat to a lot of the comments that, that the community has offered and, and, and spoken about. Uh, and that, that's gonna come back to our ambassadors for equity and social justice to keep working on helping our kids. So thank you to the panelists. And then I'm gonna turn this over for, for um, our conclusion with uh, our prosecutor, Sherry Bevan Walsh. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Natanya, for doing such an excellent job of moderating this panel. Um, very good, Tanya. We all really appreciated how you handled things. Um, also, just want to personally thank all of our panelists. Um, this was, I, I think, a wonderful discussion. Um, obviously, I think all of you may know I've uh, been in my position now for over 20 years, and you know, there's just always more to do. There's always more to do. There's always more to learn. Um, I took several pages of notes just from the comments that all of you made. Um, it just was, you know, very enlightening. And I want to thank everybody who participated. Um, there were lots of great comments in the chat, lots of questions. Um, I think probably my only regret is, wow, this time went really fast. Um, you know, an hour and a half seemed like it was going to be a really long time. <laughs> um, but boy, that went by fast. And I'm sure we could all stay on here. It would take at least a couple more hours to get through all the questions. So um, as Tanya said, I think at the beginning, this um, is not the only time we're going to do this. I think this has been very productive. Um, so we will do this again. And thank you all for participating. And, um, you know, there's always hope and we, uh, we'll continue to do everything that we can. So thank you and have a good rest of your evening.